You are locked into the Cowbell Kingdom podcast, frontline coverage of the Sacramento Kings. Now, here are your hosts, Jonathan Santiago and James Ham. Welcome to the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. I am James Ham. With me, as always, Mr. Jonathan Santiago. Today, we are joined by the Sacramento Kings 2013 first round draft pick, Mr. Ben McLemore. Ben, it's so nice to have you on. Hey, how you doing? I'm glad to be on. All right. Well, hey, it's been a busy summer for you already, it sounds like. I mean, we've seen video of you throwing out the first pitch in the Cardinals game. I know you've been back to Lawrence. How has your summer been so far? Well, my summer's been great. You know, it's been a, I think it's going to be a long summer, but it's definitely been – it started off great. So I'm definitely excited, you know, to get better this summer. All right, we know that you're, uh, again, you've been in Lawrence, you're back in Sacramento right now, but what's been going on, on out in Lawrence, Kansas? I know you plan on starting take uh, starting classes next week, but sort of what is your summer vision here as far as what's going to happen with you? Yeah, right there, just um, getting ready to, you know, start classes and, you know, and push on and get my degree. And, you know, and also just, being out there, just working out. You know, I've been working out, you know, since, since I guess I had a little, little break, you know, after the season. But you know, me being the gym that I am, I, you know, right back at it, working out and stuff. And you know, back I was last week was there, you know, working out and back in, you know, Kent's facility, you know, just getting better. And you know, now I'm back here um, in Sacramento and you know, doing the same thing, getting better. You know, working here. With the, with the with the film, with the staff and stuff. So Ben, too, you you know, talk about you being back in in Lawrence, or you were there for a little bit. Plan on going back there again. You know, did you get to uh, you know touch base with with Coach Self and have him kind of assess you know what you did in your rookie year? Um, I know I got the chance to meet all the, all the coaches, uh, especially Coach Self and Coach Townsend. You know, two two of my main guys. You know, and you know, me and Coach Self, we sat down, we talked. Well, you know, he he seen that you know I had a great rookie season, and I also finished off strong in my rookie season. So, you know, we just get, you know catching up, you know, talking, you know, about that, and you know, just keep being able to catch up with each other. You know, Ben, um, the one thing I really like about Coach Self is we've seen a lot of Kansas players come through, but he really he takes his uh, his job serious in that he doesn't just look for the the clean cut guys that have like the easiest life who have just you know coasted through and have a 4.0. I mean, he really finds guys and he works with them and he helps them become men as well as you know as well as basketball players and I know like yourself Thomas Robinson Darnell Jackson I mean you guys haven't had the easiest go in life and that's something I really respect about Bill uh, Bill Self what is it that he's taught you and did you guys have any like personal talks about sort of how you're transitioning from from the college ranks to the NBA well yeah like you said he definitely you find those guys that he knows that's going to work and, you know, didn't really have that much growing up and that he knows that's going to put in the work each and every day because of the, uh, how, where they came from and, you know, where they didn't have and you know, stuff like that. So um, definitely he helped me learn a lot, you know, my first two years there and just being, a, you know, a player and also a, a person. It helped me mature a lot. You know, and just being, giving me the understanding of life and the game of basketball. You know, Ben, you're out there right now, and and I know last season you were the seventh pick. The year before, again, Thomas Robinson was what the fifth pick, and you know, mm-hmm. Coach Self has two guys that are sitting there that are going to be top three picks. Have you got to meet Andrew Wiggins or uh, Joel Embiid and sort of talk to them and, and you know see what they look like as players? Um, I mean, I mean, when I got drafted, I was down there. You know, when they was down there, I just playing pick up. But you know, other you know, after my season, I you know just you know I haven't you know really get the chance to you know catch up with them and be able to talk to us. We're talking to Ben McLemore here, uh, the Sacramento Kings on the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. Jonathan Santiago and James Ham. With you, Ben. You know, we, you mentioned there just how you how you finished the season fairly strong. You know, we saw 
what you did in that final game, obviously, against the Phoenix Suns. I think it was like 31 points, five rebounds, uh, five assists, you know, arguably your best game of the season. Just just walk us through what what changed for you, you know, in that fi- in the final few weeks of the year where you started to, you know, play with a lot more poise. Was the game just kind of slowing down for you at that point? Yeah, definitely. Because, <laughs> you know, you get in the season, I knew, you know, as a rookie, I wanted to, you know, not try to mess up. I want everything was going to be more faster for me and stuff like that. And definitely I was moving like Ferrari <laughs> out there, just moving around and then not getting to understand it for the game. And, you know, throughout the season, you know, uh, my teammates, my coaches, and myself, you know, help, help myself that – to get an understanding of the game and you know it's not a it's certain times you can be fast you can be slow and and I learned that you know and, and into my game especially being a, a wing player a two guard that I was going to have a needed some pace throughout my game and when I started figuring that out throughout the season it definitely helped me a lot on the defensive end and also the offensive end. Ben, how did how did exit interviews go when the season concluded? You know, you get the chance to sit down with Coach Malone and I'm sure the other coaching staff, other members of the coaching staff, probably Pete Del Sandro and his staff. Just what were what was some of the input that you know maybe Coach Malone and and you know re- the rest of the Kings brass gave you in terms of what they'd like to see you do um, and focus on in particular this summer going into next season. Every day, you know. That was good that I finished off strong, you know, to take that what I finished this season on to the next season and then keep that momentum. And, and that's what I definitely need. You know, that's why I need to have a great summer this year um, and also have a, you know, a great time and a great summer. And then some of the, you know, and just, you know, little things like that, they were just telling me that, you know, I just need to keep working. They know that I'm going to keep working because of my work that I'm a, I'm a workaholic. And I want to work, and I want to learn, I want to get better. And, you know, that's pretty much it. You know, they know all the hard work that I'm going to put in to get better and, you know, and work on my game. You know, we worked, we talked about that. Uh, but, you know, one of that I need to work on to create more, you know, to get my shot open, you know, get stronger, eat healthy, you know, sh- shooting, ball handling, little things like that that we all, you know, the staff and and myself, that we all know that I need to work on. You know, Ben, I know you're back in Sacramento right now, but while you've been away, I've I've also heard that the Kings sent someone out to work with you. What has that experience been like? What are they What are they trying to focus on with you? And and who's coming out and hanging out with you back there in Lawrence? Yeah, um, definitely. I think that's a great thing to do, you know, just keeping, you know, so they can keep their hands on you and, you know, they can have their guys, you know, work work, work, work with you on the things they they know will be, what they will know what, what I need to work on and that I know what I need to work on too. And, you know, they had Greg, you know, Greg out there, you know, helping me, you know, with the things that I know I need to work on my game, you know, for us like finishing around the basket, working on my shot ball and, you know, little things like that. And, you know, it helped me a lot, and that will help me a lot, you know, going into next season and then this also this summer. Yeah, I think you're talking about Greg St. Jean there, of course, the son of former Sacramento Kings head coach <clears throat> Gary St. Jean. And he's he's probably done a lot of work with you, you know, uh, this past season. I remember, what was it, um, like early in the season after a practice, uh, you know, it was you and, you and Ray taking on – uh, Greg and and Coach Gent in a two on two contest, and I think they they kind of had your number. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I remember that at the beginning of the season. <laughs> I think around that time. But you know, it's just you know the opportunity to have someone to come down and help you know help you work on your game, and you know I, it's something I, I would love to you know constantly happen throughout my whole you know summer. You know, just having, you know, different coaches come down and help me working on my game. And then having Dee Brown, Coach Jen, Greg, you know, Coach Malone just coming down to see me and help me, you know, work on my game and work on the things I need to work on for next season. You know, Ben, discussing the Summer League now, you are going to play <clears throat> again in, in Summer League this this off season. 
you know, are there any, what, what is the likelihood or the possibility of you maybe running a little point guard there to perhaps help you work on your ball handling skills? And if that were the case, would that be something that you would be open to, 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 to do in terms of, you know, again, working on your ball handling and, and passing from the point guard position? Yeah, definitely. I think it helped me, you know, work, helped me a lot. You know, like I said, working on my own learning game and, you know, just getting the feel of bringing the ball up, you know, you know, you know directing, you know, the offense and, and controlling it. You know, and it helped me a lot as a person and a player to understand the game. So I think that's a great idea for, you know, the coaches, the staff, and, you know, people to have me run a little bit more. You know, Ben, it seems like this last season um, with with you guys having so much firepower from DeMarcus Cousins, Rudy Gay, Isaiah Thomas, that at times you kind of got lost in the shuffle. And and I know that's something that the coach is working on. We've had conversations with him. But is, is being assertive and, and sort of making sure that the other players know that you're ready – and that that you want the ball is that something that you also have to work on maybe being a little more vocal uh both on the floor and in huddles and, and saying look hey i'm open you guys got to find me yeah this is the whole point of this of this game and this leading you know and you know just understanding the game you know and i'm starting to understand the game and i know i can be vocal i know i can talk and i'm you know, things like that so definitely i think that can help a lot you know, and, you know, going into next year, I definitely will be one of them to be able to step up and, you know, and just be more vocal and just help. You know, I'm a team. I'm, also, I'm, all, I'm always going to be a team player to, you know, do whatever it is to you know, help the team out. And if not, in the case of that's what I need to do, I'm, I will step up to play and do it. You know, you had this rookie season where you had a lot of ups and downs, um, but sitting beside you for most of the season was Ray McCallum. How much of a bond did you guys form throughout this season, and how happy were you for him to get that opportunity late in the season where he just got so much playing time and was really able to take off? Yeah, you know, it was just the same bond, you know, with me and Jamari back in Kansas. And when we set out our first year, you know, that helped that first year helped us, you know, get a good bond with each other, um, to, um, and throughout our whole, you know, our whole life, you know, we we're gonna be brothers, you know, and you know, like going back to me and Ray, you know, being able to play, getting drafted to the same team, and knowing each other before we get drafted, this is crazy. And then, you know, it's just it helps us a lot, bonding with each other, understanding each other. You know, and understanding each other on the court, and, and it helps a lot. And then we had his performance, you know, being able to get his chance to go out there and show what he can do and have the opportunity, and he showed up. You know, I, we don't want to keep you all day, Ben, but I know you, you – when you get drafted in the league, it, it's a tough decision because you're giving up college and, and you're sort of stepping up to the plate. And I know you've had a family history that, you know, really money became a huge issue in, in this decision. How nice has it been for you to be able to take care of your mom, take care of your siblings and sort of, you know, get everybody on the right path and, and sort of, you know, get this windfall that's just incredible for you and everyone around you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I got great people around me, and my circle is pretty tight. And, you know, just, you know, just having to understand it of the game and, and all this, you know, and it's, I think this first year has helped me a lot to uh, get an understanding of this whole, you know, situation and me even coming from nowhere and not having this and that. It just give me, just open my eyes a little bit more, you know. And like I said, I got great people around me, my family. You know, my sucker is pretty tight. All right, Ben. Well, hey, one last thing. How excited are you to trade in that pink backpack uh, for a real backpack and get yourself back to college? Oh, man, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm really excited, man. I'm ready to get rid of it. Man. Just, right now, I sit in my room ready to get you know, pass on to the next person. <laughs> That's right. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, ben McLemore, 
uh, a rookie last year, but no longer a rookie for the Sacramento Kings. Thanks for coming in, Ben. Uh, thank you. Thank you to Ben McLemore for dropping by. You know, John, uh, that kid, if nothing else, he is a, a hard worker. He's a guy who has some lofty dreams for himself. Uh, he definitely doesn't lack confidence. So, I, I mean, we'll see what happens. He, his rookie year was not great, but, uh, you know, I think that there is a future with Ben McLemore. Yeah, I think a lot of people, a lot of fans get caught up in the stats and then see the performance on the court, but that only tells you part of the story. I say it all the time. I think this kid works very hard. He spends a lot of time with the coaches, and he's eager to learn. You know, he wants to uh, he wants to be the best player he can be, and you have to have that at least. You know, there are players out there who have talent, but they don't have that desire, and I think Ben McLemore has the desire to – to, you know, we're not saying he's going to be a superstar or he's going to be a, you know, the next Ray Allen, as as some might have touted, and even, I mean, maybe even himself a little bit, but uh, he's a kid who works extremely hard and will put in the work to to squeeze every ounce of his, uh, his potential. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and talking about, you know, sort of the potential and, you know, young players draft picks i mean we we got to see on uh on t uh, today thursday that the uh the nba draft measurements start to roll out H have you had a, a chance to look over some of these things john because i mean I, I think a lot of guys made themselves some really good money i, I mean uh, there was some concern that aaron gordon wasn't tall enough and he measures in at you know, six, seven and a half without shoes. So we're looking at, you know, legit six, eight and a half, six, nine player. Uh, that's huge for him. Noah Vonley comes in and throws down a seven foot, four and a half inch wingspan. I mean, what's sticking out for you so far? Yeah, you know, some people have the concerns about Aaron Gordon. I mean, I was, you know, I spoke to the guy a couple weeks ago and seeing him in person, he does look like a legitimate six foot, eight and a half, six foot nine. And you know, there have been players in this league who <clears throat> are a little bit shorter and have had some success, um, you know, doing things, doing one skill uh, at a quite at quite an elite level. Uh, Kenneth Farid is is one guy who, who who's uh, whose name kind of comes to mind there. But, you know, Aaron Gordon yeah, seems like a nice player, um, you know, for an 18 year old, especially, you know, I'm talking about based on my you know, brief interaction with him. Um, seems like a guy who's already pretty mature. You know, he's he kind of knows how to handle the media at this point. He's going to turn 19 in, in September. So, uh, wow. you know, he's he's a young guy, and I think he's a guy who has, who has a lot of potential and would probably make sense for the Kings if they stayed at seven or if they moved down a little bit. But, um, yeah, the draft combine, it's interesting. I was reading an article on Draft Express earlier – um, either last night or maybe this morning, and um, Jonathan Gavoni talking about the deterioration of the draft combine and some of its usefulness. And it seems like you know the agents have started to started to um, uh, kind of influence their control of the situation more so in recent years, and that's why you have guys who are going to be possibly top three picks in this year's draft: Jabari Parker. Um, Wiggins, uh, Andrew Wiggins, and Joel Embiid sitting out, not even showing up. You know, we've seen guys in the past who were number one, you know, potential number one picks, just not participating and participate in anything but the interview portion. But for those guys not to come out, period. You know, I it's it's interesting the way, I guess the combine has deteriorated in terms of uh, its its value. Uh, you know, I think the NBA has to do something about that um, in terms of, you know, exerting its influence on, on making sure they can get all these guys there so that these teams can kind of have an easier, you know, easier route uh, in terms of evaluating in addition to all the other stuff that they do. Yeah, definitely. I, I would agree with you. This is it's kind of gone the way of the NFL, right? This is what's happened in the NFL where all of a sudden quarterbacks wouldn't throw. And then next thing you know, they're doing pro days. I don't think players are going to start doing pro days for the NBA. But if they do, again, these are such hollow, hollow pro days because they don't run up against anyone. So I think what we're going to see here, 
is I think you're right. I mean, a lot of players do come through, even when they come through Sacramento. You know, I remember Brandon Knight, uh, Damian Lillard. These guys didn't want to go up against anybody. And people are like, hey, how about you show up and you like, you know, you show us that you're better than the the guard that's, you know, right next to you. And, you know, I would love to see uh, Wiggins and Parker go at it in a in a pre-draft workout. That would never and, happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're not you know, going to go up against each other. I know, but it doesn't make sense that they wouldn't because if you want to show that you're the best, you need to beat the best. And I remember like a couple of years ago, Tobias Harris and uh, Tyler Honeycutt were matched up against each other in like in like nine uh, different workouts for different teams. They went around the country basically touring together. And of course, Honeycutt falls you know, into the second round and Tobias Harris goes uh, something like 19, right, to Milwaukee. To or, Milwaukee. Yeah, Milwaukee. Yeah, and, and the reason, one of the main reasons why, was that, uh, like, soaking wet, uh, Tyler Honeycutt weighed 165, and Tobias Harris weighed in at 225. So you're looking at, like, a this, like, astronomical size difference between these two players, and you're like, why would your agent put you up against a dude who's 60 pounds heavier than you? You know, you're just going to get dominated in the post, and I, that's what happened. Um, so, yeah, I I guess at the end of the day, they're going to do what they're going to do, right? There's nothing you can do. I don't think the NBA can force these guys to show up, uh, but they can't even force them to go to specific teams. I mean, hey, if the Sacramento Kings land the number two pick in the draft or the number three pick in the draft somehow, it's possible that guy that only one or or even none of the top three will come to Sacramento for a workout. Yeah, maybe they'll just kind of like what happened in 2012 when, when Harrison Barnes and Thomas Robinson and uh, Every, Bradley everyone. Beal, everyone outside of Anthony Davis, Michael Kidd Gilchrist, they didn't want to come out and work for the ki- work out for the Kings because they Actually, were all Kid Actually, Kidd Gilchrist did. Kidd Gilchrist did come and work out for the Kings. He's no, he the didn't. only one. Are you sure? He did not work out for the Kings. Only Damian Lillard and Andre Drummond showed up that year, who were the top ten lottery picks um, in that draft. John Henson came out and worked worked out for the Kings initially, and I think uh, who was it? I think Tyler Zeller also worked out for the Kings that year. But no Michael K. Gilchrist, no Thomas Robinson, no Harrison Barnes, no Bradley Beal. All those guys were all trying to position themselves for two through. Two through four, basically, and you know yeah. the leftover was basically well. There were two leftovers: Harrison Barnes and and Thomas Robinson, and we know the story there. Robinson went five, and and Harrison Barnes went seven. But you know, we're granted regardless of this whole process. You know, the 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 things that I take away from the the pre draft combine mostly are the measurements. Those are what I pay attention to. I don't really pay attention too much to the drills because you know what. How are these things gonna actually like translate? Like bench press. Remember when? Remember when Kevin Durant was at the combine in like 2007, and everybody was saying, "Oh, he can't bench press whatever it was. He was he was like thin as a rail." But did that matter? I mean, the guy just won MVP this year, and there was like this whole hubbub about the fact that he might not be strong enough for the NBA, and like that didn't that doesn't really matter. So what I really pay attention to are. You know, how how tall is a guy really? Uh, you know, his wingspan, um, hand size is pretty cool to know. Um, and at the same time, I think the interviews for the teams are very valuable because it's the first time that these teams really get an opportunity to sit down with these prospects. And it seems like the NBA combine, um, that's something that's kind of out of the control for the players at this point or, or the players' agents at this point. Is, is who these teams get to interview at the Combine. So that's a good thing. But everything else, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the workout process, uh, uh, you know, for, for teams. When you see a guy competing against another guy, okay, that's, you know, that's pretty good. It's nice to see Tyreek Evans and, and Drew Holiday and Brandon Jennings and who else, Tony Douglas or whoever, all of them, like, compete in the same workout. Stephen Curry. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's one workout. You know, where you're evaluating their basketball talent on what you see them, what you've seen them do in the collegiate ranks and in the in the international ranks. It's it's a nice little supplement, but to me, it's not as important as 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 I mentioned the interviews and and just the uh, 
the basic measure measurements of these players going into the draft. Yeah, I really like, I mean, for me, this is always like Christmas. I, I love like combing through the stats and then looking back, you know, I, I think the one thing that really stuck out to me, um, like even like Noah Avonle has that huge wingspan, right? But his standing reach is only nine foot. Uh, I think it's nine foot. Let me see. Avonle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, his standing reach is nine, nine foot. And when you're six, eight, you know, six, nine and a half with shoes, whatever, uh, and your standing reach, even though you have a huge wingspan, is only nine feet. That, that's actually very intriguing because I remember uh, when Hassan Whiteside and uh, and Demarcus Cousins came out in the draft and at the same time, the same year, they both had huge wingspans, right? But they also their they were slightly narrow through the shoulders, and their wingspan was mostly arms. So they equated to a nine foot five standing reach. Which is incredible, and you know, like, why does that matter? And it's like, well, you know, if you're a shot blocker, and the guy's got a nine five standing, you know, standing reach, he he can get off the ground a lot faster. He I, and he doesn't need to get off the ground as high. I mean, he's right there already at the rim. I mean, these guys are are so long uh, as athletes, and you know, again, I I think what was it, uh, Kawhi Leonard? Everyone just shocked at his hand size. Those are fun things. I, I like going through the sort of all breaking all of these things down and looking at them, the finer nuances of, of the NBA draft, which of course we're going to get into a lot heavier. You know, we've got the draft lottery coming up on Tuesday uh, where we'll find out if the Kings stay at seven, you know, they have the potential to drop all the way down to 10, which is highly unlikely um, or to go one, two or three, which again is highly unlikely. Um, and the Kings have drafted number seven so many times, John, uh, it's, that's the one spot in the draft where, it seems like they always end up in number seven. I mean, Jason Williams, Bobby Hurley, Walt Williams, uh, Bobby, I mean, not Bobby, uh, Lionel Simmons, uh, you know, all of these times that the Kings have drafted at number seven, even Jim Fredette was supposed to be at number seven and they ended up trading Ben McLemore. Um, you know, it's one of those spots in the draft where it kind of feels like they're always destined to be. It's the mediocre spot. It's like, you're not horrible, but you're also not good very good but so it all depends too on the draft i mean you can get number seven in a deep draft like this and it's not it's not like getting number seven in the 2011 draft that was fairly shallow you know yeah and well, so and yeah go there ahead. there are players that fall anyways right yeah. i mean andre uh andre drummond dropped down lower than he should have he went below this spot in the draft i you know john henson went i think number seven to milwaukee right and i don't think he's He's oh, worth. I think he went like thirteen or something. Oh, did he drop that far? Yeah. Oh, uh, my bad. Um, yeah, I. You know, there are players that are good at, at seven. There are players that aren't good at seven. But this draft in particular is very strange because fourteen. Oh wow, he was slated to go higher. I know that, and I know the Kings liked him. Um, they even liked him higher than that, um, where they were drafting. But still, I mean, it's one of those deals where you're looking at this particular draft, and is this a six-man draft? Is it a seven-man draft? It's a dangerous spot, you know. I think this is truly a five-man, high-end, top, you know, top-end draft. And then after that top five, then it's going to kind of get a little strange. Like we don't know where a guy like Von Lee will go. We don't know where Gordon would go. We don't know where Marcus Smart will go. Um, and he's an, another guy who you know didn't didn't really measure out great today uh he came up at six two you know a little over six three with shoes on um you know he's not quite the size of tyreek evans which a lot of people want to compare him to um you know so i don't this is it's going to be a fun draft to watch john and especially if, if somehow the kinks can get up higher than you know that number seven pick it would all be answered next week on may 20th 2014 the nba draft lottery presented by espn <laughs> that's our plug for espn we're not we're not contractually obligated to do that but i just felt the need to do that nice yeah and that's also it's probably the biggest night in sacramento king's history because not only will the draft lottery take place but also uh city council will get an opportunity to vote on the terms for the new arena uh so it, it could go down as a monumental night in sacramento um, which should be a lot of fun. I, I think we're going to have to be bouncing around doing a lot of different things. Yes, indeed. Yes, and then I'm hopping on a plane and going to Cancun. 
That's fun. I'm happy for you. Oh, happy birthday to you as well. We can't go without mentioning that. It is James Ham's birthday today. And, That's right. Um, you know, it's a, it's a day of celebration because you've been on this earth for a, 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 a short amount of time. Let's I not talk about that, John. I think it's only been like <laughs> 20 years or so. <laughs> you, hey, and you, you can know, find John, you're close to drinking now. You're, yeah, you're, that's it. Yeah, I'm almost <laughs> a drinking age. Exactly. I wish. Uh, and it's also my wife's birthday. We we share uh, the same birthday. We I'm four years older than she is, but um, yeah, we're both uh, May 15th birthdays. So, John, let's get into uh, let's transition from the happy birthday to uh, the ugly side of this week. Um, and we we released a video yesterday. Uh, sat down with Jason Thompson. Again, we'll plug Makuni. Makuni uh, Taro put us up. Let us uh, take full run of his restaurant and interview Jason Thompson a little while back. Um, we finally put it up uh, at a time where it's not going to be get buried by uh, Donald Sterling news until, of course, later on today when Donald Sterling says something else stupid. Um, but uh, Jason Thompson. Not exactly happy about the way that the 2013-2014 Sacramento Kings played out for him. Yeah, he was not happy. Um, and <laughs> he just, you know, he was honest. I mean, and and the sad thing is a lot of fans are going to watch the video and they're going to say, shut up, Jason Thompson, quit complaining. You're not good enough to complain. and 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 moan and cry about your role on this team and you know they do have somewhat of a point but at the same time he has a point to be unhappy he's he hasn't been traded but it's almost like he's played for like five different franchises at this point in his career I mean he's gone through two ownership groups as you mentioned in the post he's had uh you know five is it five different coaches now Five. Re Reggie yeah. Theus, Kenny Nat, Paul Westfall, Keith Smart, and Michael Malone. Five different coaches, a ton of different uh, assistant coaches, you know, 70 different teammates. So, again, yeah, he's, it's like he has been traded multiple times, but, you know, hasn't, uh, hasn't, hasn't really been traded, obviously. And, you know, I, I can sympathize with a guy like Jason Thompson because I think I've said it before here. I've written about it in the past. He's a guy who – You've never heard him complain like this. I mean, this is six years into his career. He's always said the right things. He's always done, um, you know, the right things, whether it's on the court or in the community. He's always done what's been asked of him, and he's always worked really hard. But for whatever reason, um, you know, the Kings have always just brought in other guys to, to come in and take his job because they think that they could find somebody better than him. And that might be true. But at the same time, you know, imagine if you were in his position. Imagine if you were working at a job for the last six years and you got passed over for a promotion multiple times by 10 different people who you knew that you were better than, that you've beaten out, that you've outworked in the past uh, when it comes to different kinds of projects, and yet you still don't get any respect. Do you relate now? Do you see, do you see, you know, some of the similarities there? I mean, you got to look at this beyond just a guy making millions of dollars in basketball terms. You know, it, he's, he's in a similar position that many of us in everyday life are in, in, in our own jobs where, you know, you're trying to do something the right way. You've done things the right way. You've done everything you've been told and yet you're not rewarded for it. Now it is frustrating to be in his position. Um, but at the same time, I could also say that he has to be a guy that looks at his situation and, you know, it's okay to get frustrated and acknowledge you're frustrated, but continue to be positive and, and to continue to know that you're going to put the work in and eventually you'll land somewhere or be in a place where um, you'll, uh, you'll be appreciated. But Unfortunately, here it just really seems like it's it's coming to the end or it's coming to a close here uh, with the Sacramento Kings and Jason Thompson. Again, he's been such a, a great ambassador for the community, um, you know, and, and for the Kings in the community. Um, but it's just it's it's such a tough position to be in when you've you've been here for so many years, and again, you've you've done things the right way, yet you haven't been rewarded for it. 
Yeah, John, and I, I want to point out a couple of things. First and foremost, like if you watch the interview with Jason Thompson, he doesn't call out any specific teammate. He doesn't throw anyone specific under the bus. He complains about things that are specific to his situation and are specific to his teammates that aren't in the top three, that aren't the big three. It's it's a very frustrating thing. We've talked about this a little bit, right? How there are – we even asked Coach Malone about it. There are players on this team that aren't happy that three guys control the ball the entire time. Jason Thompson's shooting uh, – he went from – averaging nine shots a game last year to six shots a game this year. And he started 61 games. It's really frustrating when you're in a position uh, that you think is a good thing, but it's really not. It, he probably would have been better off coming off the bench for this team, being a primary go-to post score off the bench because this team doesn't – with Carl Landry injured, this team didn't have another bench score. Uh, you know, a guy that could really take the ball in the post and do some things. So I think you can see the the frustration bubbling out. But what this is, is it's a player getting to a point in his career where he's played for six years in Sacramento. Yes, he got paid. Yes, he, you know, he's going to be here most likely. Um, but he he's to a point where he looks around and other players who aren't happy with their situation – they go in, they say whatever they want. And what happens? You know, coaches get fired and and players, you know, get moved. And, you know, he, he just keeps looking at like, I guess I'm doing it wrong. I guess being a pro's pro and biting my tongue and, and you know, trying to fight the good fight here and do what I can to, to be a good teammate, it's not getting me where I want to be. And I don't think he dislikes Sacramento. I, I know he loves the fans, lots of respect. He's got two camps this summer in Sacramento. Again, his camps, they're not a money grab for him. He's a very good guy. His stuff goes directly to the Jason Thompson Foundation, which goes to heart research, and it goes to uh, children's programs. Um, he, you know, he's done canned food drives. He's He's a good person. And at some point, even a good person – looks at his situation and says, maybe I need to make some noise if, you know, because I, I guess there's only a couple of things that can happen here, right? Number one, the Kings ignore it and it just goes away. Uh, number two, he could demand a trade. Number three, the Kings could say, well, we've had enough and just deal him somewhere. So it's, it's, he's put himself in a situation that's slightly different than he was, you know, a month ago. But I think he voices this displeasure to the Kings at his exit interview. I honestly do. And, I, you know, we've we've known for a long time that him and DeMarcus Cousins don't exactly see eye to eye. That's not a secret. He didn't go on record bashing DeMarcus or, you know, Isaiah Thomas for not having, you know, eight assists a game uh, or anything else. Because I, I think at the end of the day, Jason Thompson realizes that what's wrong with the Kings wasn't specifically a, a player one player or this player or that player it was just that this season was just such a mixed bag of craziness with all these transactions all these things and in the end he's one who, one of the players who get, just got completely left out of the puzzle and it's frustrating i mean I, again he makes a really good point that that first game you know he has the tip in at the buzzer to beat uh denver and that was his third shot of the game. And, you know, it's like you want to feel hooray. But at the same time, it's like, man, I could have done so much more. We didn't have to win it at the end. You guys could have given me, a, you know, some more looks. I mean, he still shoots 50% from the field, which is better than almost any one of his teammates. You know, and, you know, is Jason Thompson a perfect player? No. But that doesn't mean he's not a solid NBA player who's going to be in the league for at least three more years and probably longer than that. Yeah, it's just – it's tough right now, I think, with him. It, it's tough to sell him on taking a role with this team. You know, again, I, I talk about all the things, like, that he has a right to be upset and frustrated uh, based on everything that he's done in the past. But at the same time, there were some things that kind of raised some eyebrows with me with what he said. I mean, the fact that he thinks that he can be a guy who can get 12 shots a game – 
uh, that's kind of questionable with this team, obviously, with, with Rudy Gay and Isaiah Thomas, if they come back, and even with DeMarcus Cousins um, in the mix, it's going to be tough for him to get that, that amount of shots a game. So, you know, to sell him on, on, on accepting a role, you know, being a guy that comes off the bench and plays minutes at center and power forward, I'm not so sure unless you can find somebody else who's who's better than him um, and can beat him out. You know that they've done that. They've done that in the past. But until they actually, you know, I think if they start winning and he's still around and he's playing that kind of role, maybe he accepts it and he buys in. But at this point, it's kind of hard for a guy like that. I think if I were in his position, it would be hard for me to buy it and say, you you want me to take in, you know, you want me to take on uh a lesser role when you know we're not winning right now that and, and you're bringing in a guy who still isn't better than me I, I I have a hard time buying into something like that or buying into a role like that so I think it would be best for all parties if they can find a way to move him to deal Jason Thompson and I think you know we talked about it last week there are there are opportunities out there with the contracts that they have you have Jason Terry's expiring deal um, you know, to, to throw in with Jason Thompson, their pick this year, depending on where it falls, to perhaps upgrade, um, get a get another solid veteran in the mix, um, you know, all-star caliber, depending on what you can get with this pick in, in this year's draft, and you can get rid of his contract. Uh, you know, I, I think there are options out there, and I think that would be, Honestly, the best the best situation for both sides would just be an amicable split at this point. Yeah, and I don't think Jason Thompson's a bad player. I I just honestly think that he's he's in a situation where he and Demarcus Cousins really, I mean they they don't do enough things differently. Uh, I don't think they do everything like they're not what you'd call like similar players, but you know Jason Thompson is is sort of a, a jack of all trades, master of none. So, I mean, he's a decent post scorer. He's got a decent jump shot. He's a decent rebounder. He's a decent shot blocker. He can pass the ball. He's, he's a well-rounded basketball player. Um, but what the Kings need alongside DeMarcus Cousins is they need a shot blocker or they need a three-point specialist. I mean, DeMarcus Cousins needs specific things to, to sort of make up for what he lacks and, Unfortunately, Jason Thompson doesn't have any of those attributes, and that's as much the issue as anything else. And and I guarantee you this: it's not going to get any better, because when you add Carl Landry to that puzzle as well, it's the same exact thing. You know, Carl Landry can score in the post, he can hit a jumper, he's not a great rebounder, he's not a great defender, he's not a shot blocker, but really he kind of does a lot of what Jason Thompson does. He's just a little bit smaller than Jason Thompson, and maybe he's a little bit tougher. So, I, you know, it, it's just it's a bad situation for Thompson, and I don't know that if the Kings can find a taker. I think you're right. I think we're seeing the last of Jason Thompson in Sacramento. Uh, but again, you know, that'll be sad. That'll be a sad day for a lot of fans because he is a good dude. He is a guy. You know, he's, he's a good. Uh, his family's awesome to work with. You know, we've dealt with them in the past. Just good people all around, and. Uh, it's been a, a miserable six-year run if you really look at the wins and losses while Jason Thompson's been here. And for him to get to go somewhere and maybe win, even if it's in a reduced role, that would probably be a, a really good situation, a fun situation for him to be in. All right, on that note, let's wrap up this edition of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. Thanks to Ben Backlamore for joining us on this edition. And once again, thanks to... Uh, Makuni Restaurants in, uh, in in Sacramento, Taro Rai, for their hospitality for the uh, Jason Thompson piece. Uh, you should go and visit their restaurant. They have the best sushi in, in it's Sacramento. It's so good. It's yeah. the best sushi in Sacramento. I don't I don't know how you could I don't know how you could go anywhere else at this point. Uh, so subscribe to us uh, on on iTunes. Be sure to rate our podcast. We always appreciate that. Subscribe to us on uh, on YouTube. Um, and uh, we'll be back again sometime soon with another edition of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast next week. So join us then. And uh, thanks for joining us this week on this edition of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast for James Ham. I'm Jonathan Santiago. See you next time.